In today's video, I will explain how I created AI that solves every vanilla bomb in Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. Before we continue, I need to put a disclaimer that my AI plays on a modded version of the game, which allows me to zoom much closer than I usually would be able to, and also shows the edge work on top of the bomb. It makes the entire process possible because there isn't any normalized movement that will get all the edge work from the bomb. If you don't know what normalized movement is, it's basically a set of moves that results in the same position every single time. Example of which would be AI placing down the bomb after rotating it, so when it picks it back up, the bomb will be in the exact same spot. Having that out of the way, we can finally talk about how everything works. At first, we need to get all the edge work from the bomb. There will always be 5 widgets on the bomb, plus serial number, which will be conveniently placed as the last one. From all the edge work that there is in the game, the only one that we will need is parallel port, lead FRK, lead car, batteries and serial number. Trying to distinguish widgets from themselves was really easy. It can be done with two checks, one that distinguishes labels, plate ports and batteries, and second to tell exactly if we have one or two batteries, and store them in a variable. Then we go through every port plate, making just one check on each to make sure that we have a parallel port. Now for labels, we need to somehow tell what is written on the label itself, but before that we can simply check if the label is lit or not, because if it isn't, we don't even need to run any further checks since this label will be useless for us. When the label is lit, then we need to check if it's either FRK or CAR, otherwise we don't need them. To do this, I'm making 16 checks on the only last letter to tell if it's K or R. If it's K, then I already know that the label we have is FRK. If it's R, I can make a singular check on second letter, which tells me if the label is CLR or CAR, giving me all I need. For serial number, I do the same thing I did for the last sign on label. I make some color checks that returns a series of ones and zeros depending if a check was on a sign or on a background. This turned out to work just fine, but I had to do a lot of edge cases. I've decided to leave it as it is for now, but I would need to change my approach later on. We have our edge work. Now we can finally start solving modules. But first, we need to know where we have modules on our bomb. This wasn't that difficult. What I had to do is simply check if there is a grey LED in the corner of the module. And if it has orange color or a different shade of grey that I don't have stored in my lookup table, that means that it's either an empty module or a timer. Now let's briefly talk about how movement in between modules work. At first we go through every module one by one and solve it immediately. We can tell which module we are on by making two pixel checks. We can't only use one because there isn't a spot that would be able to distinguish every single module from each other. If you select a module, it makes it zoom in and allows you to input stuff, so you won't make incorrect presses while rotating a bomb. Not only that, but a zoom always puts the module on the exact same spot on screen, meaning that selecting a module and deselecting it is another form of normalized movement we can use to navigate through modules easily. Speaking of modules, let's finally solve some. Let's start with the button. This module is simple. Based on a set of rules, we need to release a button when the timer has one of the digits listed, or just press and release immediately. What we want to do is first check what color and label we have on a button. We can do it using three checks, one for the color and two for label. We use them in form of truth table, which is the most efficient way of checking stuff based on pixels only. I tried using text recognition libraries or just take entire screens and compare them to other pictures I would store, like I did in my visual 2 bot. But both of those approaches were not only slower, but much more prone to error. We then want to go through each condition and check if it applies to our button. Usually we will need to hold the button and rely on a stripe that will show up. That one just requires us to check what time we currently have on our bomb, which we can simply do by making checks for the clock. Now it's time for another one. Simon says, This module on its own is quite slow, taking around 20 seconds to solve. We can't do any optimization here, so what we need to do is simply check for the first color flash as often as possible and immediately press a button that should be pressed, based on the rules we have. Checking for vowel isn't an issue and we don't even need to check for strikes since we won't have any. And after every movement, we check if the module isn't solved already and wait set amount of time. The time we need to wait varies because we only check for the color of newest stage, since the previous stage don't change at all. This module is also one when I've decided to fix some of my image recognition code, which really helped me in other modules, especially color related stuff like wires. Instead of checking for each edge case we can get and try to compare them to our lookup table, we can make a short function that returns the closest value from the lookup table, saving plenty of coding time. Next module is wires. This one is very simple. We make 6 checks for every possible wire and then we go through rules we have depending on the number of wires. 
This gives us enough information to solve the module, so let's move to the next one, being complicated wires. These are very similar to normal wires, we only need to do some more checks, then we cut every wire we can using the simplified truth table. Last wire related module is wire sequence. This one was really tricky for me and finding a good approach for it wasn't an easy task, but here is how it works. We first need to check for wires in spot 1, 2 and 3. There can't be two wires coming out of the same spot, so we can just use it as a flag if there is or isn't a wire there. Then we make several pixel checks for each wire housing, and if at least one pixel check will be different from wire housing, we know that we have a wire and we have its color. When that happens, we then make 30 pixel checks in total, 10 for each possible combination. We then compare each check to the pixel we have from the start of wire, and if at least 7 pixels are in range, we know that we have a connection. We repeat that process for each number, cut the wires we need to cut, along with storing all the colors, and go to the next stage, repeating the process until the module is solved. The reason why we need this many pixel checks is that some wires can cross others and end up in the same spot. That's why sometimes we can't exactly have 10 out of 10 checks. This approach is the safest one, because even if our wire is on the very bottom, we still will be able to find exactly where it is going. Now it's time for memory. This module was also very simple. We make another truth table to check for each number from 1 to 4, so in total we only need 10 pixel checks for each stage. After each stage we simply store the label, position and level on which this label was pressed on and when we need it, we can check exactly what, where and when was pressed. It's now time for maze, which was one of your favorite modules to work on. In theory, it's really simple. You have two circles on a maze, a white square being you and a red triangle being a goal. And based on the position of those two green circles, you need to follow a maze that matches it. Now the question is, how do we find a path? Here is the first idea that I've tried. When we have our starting position on a maze, there is a limited amount of ways we can move. Here in this example, we can only move in any of the three directions. While moving, we mark every place we explored, so on the next move, we won't go back. Usually, there will be only one way to go, but sometimes there can be more. The plan was to create a checkpoint on those spots. Their rule is to act as a backup, in case we move into a dead end. In that case, we go back to our checkpoint, block out the wrong path and go to the other one. The issue with that idea is that it's very inefficient and also kinda complicated. So I came up with a different idea, which is called flat field search. This idea is much more simpler, to the point when I was surprised that it actually turned out to be the final approach on this module. Here is how it works. Instead of randomly choosing where we should go, we move each direction once, by checking every surrounding place. If there happens to be a wall in front of us, we simply cancel the move. We loop the process as many times as needed, until one of the coordinates will match the ending coordinates. Then, we reverse the search from finish to start, going by decreasing numbers, store those numbers in array, and remove every single position that is not in an array. After we have our array of position, we reverse it and go from first position to last, while checking the difference between each position compared to the previous one. If the difference is one lower on X position, we need to move to the left, and if it's one lower on Y position, we need to move up, and so on. After we go through every position, we know where to move, based on which we can just make correct button presses, solving the module. Next one is password. This module is the first one I've approached, and first due to a pixelation of each sign, I wanted to check each pixel to see what letters we have. However, some signs like X, W, M, N, Y or I are actually on a different grid than the others, meaning that I had to make two grids, one for those and second for the other signs. Then we simply need to check every single row and then brute force the password. After the password is cracked, all we need to do is keep track of position of the correct letter and select it. This part also wasn't hard since we already were keeping track of every sign. Another module is Morse, and this one was the one I had no idea how to approach, which forced me to do some testing on how this module really works. In total, we have five different signs, dot, dash, break between signs, break between letters and break between transmit. And here are the approximate timings. With all that data, what we can do is run image recognition every frame and check for changes in the color state of LED, while keeping track the amount of frames the change took. Of course, we approach the module from the random point of transmission, so to avoid any errors, we need to omit first change. Now the question is, how do we create signs from our dots and dashes? The simple answer is that we don't. We keep track of each dot and dash, which then we compare to a lookup table that has all the words in Morse code. Notice that there is N in every string. This one keeps track of the long break that happens in between transitions. Any other break for us doesn't matter, since we aren't converting Morse code anyway. After we encounter N, we can then store every sign that we have, allowing us to have a Morse module solved in at worst only two transmissions. 
The solution however was very slow and made us waste a lot of time, so I wanted to improve it, but there was one thing I had to go around. If we start from a random point of transmission, we can tell when it starts, which is the key detail that differs what we have from our lookup table. To fix it, we can make the lookup table shift too, so every time we have a new input, we compare what we have to every possible shift of each string in lookup table and sort those that match. And if there is only one string that matches, that is our solution. Keepass was the module that was causing barely any issues, the whole trick was to check plenty of pixels, which I had to manually adjust for each key. That took a lot of time, but other than that, it was really simple. Time for the most tedious and least fun module. Who's on first? This module took insane amount of time. The approach is similar as in Keepass, but there were more buttons, more precision, and a display that also had 28 different variations. Having to not only code 56 groups of pixel checks, but also adjust them so I could have them in a loop that will go through the same position on different buttons, was really boring, but after a lot of time, everything worked just fine. If you are curious how the final product looked like and you haven't watched it, go check out my video that will be in the description. Thank you so much for watching and if you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more content.